Break things down. Which is which? The thing, muscle builders are taking anabolic steroids to bulk up, um, to build muscle. Um, don't ask me why, but I think of cannibals and I think of cannibals. <laughs> 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 um, okay. So um, both of these processes are linked. Definitions I want you know for types of organisms. First one is an autotroph. <coughs> so what do what are autotrophs capable of? Does auto mean <laughs> does it yourself? Does it themselves? Yeah. So autotrophs are capable of synthesizing all their biomolecules. Which means they have to get energy from somewhere. And if it isn't from other organic things, where are they getting it from? The atmosphere, the environment. Yeah, but if you're if you're, uh, if you're an autotroph and you aren't using any other biomolecules around you, you're only using inorganics from the soil or from the air, then the energy has to come. The sun. The sun. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the plants are on <laughs> They can do photosynthesis and make ATP. Okay, and then the other type is heterotroph. Um, and these depend on um, other organisms.
unexpected reactions. Um, usually catalyzed by enzymes. And lead um, to your biosynthesis. Known um, metabolic reactions. Not every single pathway happens in every single cell and every single cell. <laughs> so there's a table in your book that lists some uh, different locations um, inside the cell. We will really focus mostly on mitochondria versus cytosol. So um, most of what we do will be those two locations. Um, but you've got other stuff going on in other places inside the cell. Um, there was a little section um, uh, about the secretory pathway for proteins that are going down that we kind of skimmed through really fast last semester. It was in the chapter on, oh, which chapter was a membrane transport. Yeah. Um, so if you want to go back, you can read about that. Um, but we're going to hit these two hard. Or 
our same energy transfer molecules. carbohydrates and lipids and how they, they feed into this. Um, but just to point out now, there are some common molecules that they all will feed into. So pyruvate at the end of glycolysis, um, you get amino acids and you get lipids that also feed into that. Um, Acetylcholine A, uh, all three can feed into. Um, our energy transfer molecules, we're really looking at um, uh, our electron transfer molecules, so FAD and MED, or MEDP, um, for energy <coughs> transfer, and then uh, ATP for phosphoryl transfers is our other one. So um, you see those all over the place. So whenever you need energy for something, it's either going to come from an electron transfer or it's going to come from um, uh, a phosphoryl transfer or hydrolysis. Um, so ATP. NAD, um, we're going to look more closely at this next time, but uh, you've got these little phosphate linkages, or kind of like oh, it's right there. Okay. <laughs> 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 uh, so phosphate and hydrides. Um, these are very high energy bonds, so we'll talk about why um, on Monday. Um, but whenever you hydrolyze one of these, um, you release quite a bit of energy. Um, whenever you do a phosphoryl transfer, that, that's energy bond still exists, and so it's kind of transferring energy from one molecule to another. Um, for the NAD, I'm really not concerned that you know the whole structure. Please don't worry about that. ATP, we're, we're going to be able to draw that, but um, I'm not going to worry about you having the whole structure for this. Mostly, you just need to know that there's an oxidized form and a reduced form, um, and uh, you can pick up the electrons to become reduced, and then later you can give them up to something else and be oxidized. And the, the NAD PC versus just the NAD um, is just a different somewhat pathway as you see them in, but their function um, in terms of carrying electrons is typically the same. Um, so you see NAD P a lot with uh, lipid biosynthesis, um, whereas you see the NAD more with the glycolysis pathway. And then the citric acid cycle. J going to equal 
Zero? Zero, yeah. Just like the <laughs> zero equilibrium. Um, yeah, that's not a good state for a living organism to be in because at that point you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> that's sad. <laughs> So this will be the slowest step. It is usually the first committed step. But not necessarily the first step. say is the first committed step is the first reaction that takes place that you can no longer go backwards anymore. This is often identified by a large negative free energy chain. Delta G, what does that mean in terms of thermodynamics? Spontaneous. 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 when you are not at equilibrium is called Q and it's the reaction quotient. At equilibrium, delta G equals what? And so if you plug in zero for this, then you can rearrange that, um, and you get that your standard free energy change is equal to negative RT natural log um, of now K. So now Q becomes K, this is that equilibrium. Temperature, 
his tent. And what does it need to be in? Kelvin. It needs to be in Kelvin. Otherwise, you'll get a wrong answer. Delta G, not in whatever I call that little party thing. Um, that is your standard free energy change. Definition of standard state. And what does that include? One atmosphere. One atmosphere. Two ninety eight Kelvin. Two ninety eight Kelvin. For twenty five degrees Celsius. Seven, I think. Yes. Oh, seven is it, it doesn't have yes. to be zero. Um, <clears throat> I'm thinking. Because technically you could have an acid base reaction that you're looking at. Um, but yeah, you're, you're just assuming that, that there aren't any proton ions around um, unless they're actually involved in the reaction. So, so yes, that definition works. I know it's not a question. Doesn't work for the biochem definitions, so we just look at the radar. Um, so one atmosphere, 298 K. There's one other big important one. Concentration. 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 We have one, one molar in initial concentrations of all species involved in the reactive state. It's a liquid, it's a pure liquid, it's a solid, it's a pure solid. If you have a little prime, that is the biochemist definition of standard state. Um, when they're both on here, then we are actually just assuming both work. Okay. Um, so the biochemist said both sort of things. One atmosphere. Yeah, one atmosphere, 298K. So that, that, that's already listed with our little knot. So what's new? pH 7. pH is equal to 7. Okay, so that tells you what your, your hydrogen on is. Uh, what else did biochemists say? Water is like 55, yeah. 57. So water is the solvent. <laughs> And at um, uh, a concentration of 55.5 molar. That, that is actually the concentration of pure water, is 55.5 molar. Um, so usually when you when you look at um, equilibrium constants, you, you don't put solvents in there. Um, and water, we're gonna see water is often um, a reactant or a product of a lot of these reactions, but we have to ignore it because it's always 55.5 molar. This is our solvent. So that's the concentration, sorry. Concentration of 55.5 molar. Okay. So we're at pH 7, and we're ignoring our concentration of water, and then there's one more kind of important. of the cell and you add it up, you get um, kind of a, a physiological ion concentration. 
And so it's fixed. So even though one species actually might change, the total ion concentration is fixed. Um, so if you're thinking about any one particular ion, it is fixed. So we don't, we don't treat ions as, as separate species for concentrations. It's well, you see, that's your magnesium any, or calcium or any ion you're looking at, it actually might fluctuate for an individual one, but yeah. because um, any fluctuation you see inside a living cell is not going to be that significant, and the exception would probably be um, uh, cases where you're doing some sort of uh, membrane potential change or letting ions cross membranes, but, but in the cell, the level of concentration is fixed. So you might move it from one place to another, but it, um, so you know, in in the end, we just kind of ignore all the ion concentrations in the base. And magnesium you will see a lot as a cofactor in a lot of these reactions, but we don't bother to pay attention to it. Okay. So review time. This is a nice question. I'm going to write it out there. So I want you to calculate. Oh. Oh. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to calculate if you even need a natural log function for this. Oh. Um, <laughs> calculate the equilibrium constant at 25 degrees Celsius for a reaction. the standard free energy change is equal to negative 15.0 kilojoules per mole. Please be careful with your units. <coughs>
So even if you don't know, you might want to log in something so I know you're here. <laughs> Delta G not prime thing equals negative R T. Natural log of okay. okay. So we're solving for K. Might want to switch it over. Sorry? Oh, can't you see that? <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, so delta G was given as minus 15 kilojoules per mole. Um, we're just going to change that. 15,000 joules per mole. <laughs> and that's equal to a negative R, which is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Times the temperature in Kelvin, which is 298K, natural log of K. Um, you should get 6.05 is equal to the natural log of K. And then if you take the B e of, of size, you get a K equal to the first one that uses it. I guess it's like Every calculator is a little different on how they do the log anti log function. So for this exam, make sure you know how to do it. Spontaneous. If it isn't spontaneous, then um, it's never going to want to go in the direction you want the pathway to go. Um, so we can identify them by having this large negative delta G. Um, and so basically, what you see is that reactants are going to build up at this step. It's a bottleneck. For example, we have our, our A plus our B um, with this very, I'm going to start writing this as an equilibrium arrow, but this is so tiny that it frankly happens. There's a C plus D. And so if you look at the concentration of the species, the concentration of A and B are much, much greater than the concentration of C. changes are often difficult to measure in the cell. And that's usually because we just aren't sure what the concentration of all the reactive species are inside the cell. That's, that's sometimes just something that we, we, can, we can estimate, but it's, it's difficult to do. 
so, um, so instead, um, what you will typically see are standard free energy changes for reactions used to try to figure out what steps are rate limiting. So we often use um, or delta G not prime um, to look at free limiting steps. Because that is something that if we take um, the reactants and the pro uh, products and the enzyme and we make all our reactants products one molar initial concentrations, um, that is something that we can measure in vitro in the lab and test it and we can come up with a, a free energy. Just we need a calorimeter too, but, um, but we, we can actually determine that. So this is something that, that can I will say be easily determined, but it can always be determined. Um, whereas the free energy change in the cell um, that actually occurs can be different. It might not be the same number. Um, but in general, we, we can use that standard free energy change to look at well, which step is the um, most likely to be limiting, um, which direction is this pathway going to want to go based on overall free energy changes. Okay, so usually in the book, you'll, you'll see they'll go back and forth. Sometimes they will tell you that the delta G is, and sometimes they tell you that it's the standard. Delta G, um, and it's usually just a matter of which one they know um, for any given reaction. Um, maybe just one more thing with that, because we're, we're going to talk about this morning was. Um, we defined what the difference was. Um, between the chemist and the biochemist, the not and the prime. Um, but what is probably the major difference or the thing that we can't fix for the cell um, in terms of just delta G? Okay, so we said the standard free energy change has to be at one atmosphere. Can we put a cell at one atmosphere? Why not? <laughs> Can, can, we, can we make the atmospheric pressure one atmosphere? Mm -hmm. Sure, we can do that. Um, how about uh, the cell, is it going to be a physiological pH? Probably, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, the temperature, can we fix the temperature to be 25 degrees? Like so we can fix all those things, but the thing that is different inside the cell is what? Concentrations, yeah. So the concentrations are not one molar. Um, they're nowhere near one molar. That's, that's a really concentrated amount of anything. Um, physiologically, when you're looking at salt concentrations, and we know what physiological salt concentration is? Mm -hmm. It's about 150 millimolar. Um, so, you know, you're about 15% of a molar, one molar solution. And, and that's looking at all the salts, every single ionic species that's there. Um, so it's not, uh, you're not going to find anything that is in one molar concentrations. So that's just physiologically relevant, but it's something that, that we, we use to do standard free energy changes. Um, so you always have to keep in mind that the standard free energy change won't be the same as the actual free energy change in the cell because we're not at smaller initial concentrations of anything. And that does affect the number slightly. And as we go, there'll be some places where we can compare them. So this is kind of the next bullet point now in some place. <laughs> the rate limiting step is followed by several near equilibrium steps. Where your delta G is, is approximately zero.
So this ends up being our first committed step. It's far from equilibrium, and it has a large negative delta G, and then all of these other steps are fast and near equilibrium. So your delta G is approximately. equilibrium. Okay, it's always a case where you have lots and lots and lots of A. It's a slow step, has a huge negative delta G, so spontaneous going towards B, and it's always going to want to go towards B, because B is never going to accumulate. B goes away right away. It gets turned into C. C gets turned into D. D gets turned into E. And so this pushes everything towards E, so that this one will never go backwards. So the rate limiting step is technically irreversible. You will rarely see arrows drawn as just an arrow in one direction. You almost will always see equilibrium arrows, but if you want to be very careful in depicting what's going on, you should try to indicate the direction of the big arrow going um, forward. There's, there's kind of a, a bust here. Um, anabolic and catabolic pathways. There's a pathway to break down glucose. There's also a pathway to remake glucose. It cannot be the same pathway because as soon as you have a rate limiting step that's irreversible, you can't go backwards. You can't go the other way. So the pathway has to be different for synthesizing glucose from the pathway where you break it down. Um, sometimes they will share several steps, all these new equilibrium steps. They will often share these, but then there will be something different between that A and the B, there'll be different pathways for that. to our rate limiting step. That's going to control the flux for the entire pathway. But other ways you can control the rate of your pathway. Um, so this is, um, I should say, other than rate limiting step. We can have allosteric regulation of enzyme activity. Allosteric mean. Not at the binding site? Not at the binding site, yes. Yeah. So if you have some molecule binds to your enzyme, it might be um, a positive modulator or a negative modulator. So negative modulators would be inhibitors. But sometimes you have small molecules that increase activity, so it's a positive mm -hmm. modulator. Mm -hmm. um, but it binds to the enzyme, it alters activity, but it's not binding at the active site. Mm -hmm. So that's allosteric regulation. Um, covalent modification of enzymes. That's our favorite one. Phosphorylation, yeah, but we'll see other examples as well. Um, but phosphorylation is the most common one. Um, use of substrate cycles. 
And substrate cycles are usually um, set up through allosteric regulation and covalent modification, but it's a very particular type of um, uh, system for regulating the pathway. So we will talk about some of those. Can you pull the paper up? Yeah. Thank you. So we'll see examples of those as we go. And then the last one is genetic control of enzyme expression. Um, that one is the slowest of any of these um, because it takes a while to affect enzyme concentrations through gene expression. Um, so if you need to make long-term changes, that's where it's going to happen. But if you need any kind of immediate response, it's going to be one of these three that's going to affect the pathway. Okay. So that's it for the lecture part, but we've got some business to take care of. <laughs> All right, so biochemistry one has a lab. Biochemistry two does not officially have a lab, but I always do one. We do one lab in biochemistry two, and it's you know it's not graded, it's not required, it's more for fun than anything else. Um, and it's at my house. Uh, yeah, but last year, last couple of years, we've done it in one of the dorm kitchens, but um, uh, this class is small enough that you can do it in the existing house instead. So um, we do two things. We make cinnamon rolls. Um, so these are homemade cinnamon rolls. Um, and we set up um, uh, root beer and ginger ale uh, fermentation. So it all ties right into the actual material that we cover. <laughs> so um, one part, part possible fate and pyruvate at the end of glycolysis is fermentation. Um, and uh, sometimes we, we use the carbon dioxide that is made for fermentation to raise bread, so that's the something rolls. And um, sometimes we use alcohol in fermentation to do something else. Um, but we're going to make root beer, which is so low in alcohol that it's lethal. Okay. <laughs> Because to make homemade cinnamon rolls the right way, um, it takes about four hours from beginning to end to do it the right way. So uh, you don't necessarily have to come for the whole four hours. I've had people drop in at the beginning and work on at the end. But I have to have people there across the entire four hours, or otherwise I'm just doing it by myself and that's boring. So. <laughs> Uh, and then I usually, yeah, I, I usually get pizza, so I'll feed you for either a lunch or a dinner, depending on when we do it. Um, and then they'll be hot out of the oven, cinnamon rolls when we're done. So um, the root beer and the ginger ale, they have to take a few days, so those will come across later. <laughs> All right, so these are possible dates. Now we have um, a three-day weekend uh, because Friday there's no class and a faculty <laughs> development day, but then I never know whether people just disappear for the three-day weekend and we'll be out of town. Um, but one possibility is that Friday afternoon um, or Saturday, uh, so that would be over lunch or Saturday over dinner um, for that three-day weekend over Sunday um, for three to seven. This weekend lines up exactly with the material, so we will probably cover the fermentation that Wednesday, um, that Monday or Wednesday, and then the weekend for the lab. Um, or uh, we could wait and do.